Just a little bit of introduction here. We have six sessions together, and for those of you who attended the Discover Prophecy Seminar that we conducted about two and a half months ago, there's going to be some overlap, some review, but we're also going to interject some new information as well, and, and really what we're going to try and do is condense, condense, condense. That's really the objective here. Now, let me just give you a little biographical information here, autobiographical. I was totally disinterested in the things of religion at the age of 23 years old. In fact, uh, I probably would have been labeled as hostile to religion. I was studying pre-medicine at the University of Wyoming and uh, was a 4.0 student, doing well in class, you know, really no interest whatever in God or in the Bible or in religion. In fact, I would have thought it was outdated, I would have thought it was blasé, etc. And I was introduced providentially to some of the great prophecies of the Bible. Some of the great, what everyone? The prophecies of the Bible. And, and really, when you are confronted with the accuracy and the scope of the Bible's prophecies, you can only come, I believe, to two intellectually honest conclusions. One of them is either someone wrote these prophecies after the events that they allegedly foretold, or those prophecies were written beforehand and the Bible is supernatural. In other words, even when the critics of the books of, for example, Daniel in the Old Testament, when the critics take a look at Daniel, they don't say that Daniel's prophecies aren't accurate. What the critics say, what the higher critical scholars say is, the prophecies must have been written sometime in the Roman era, sometime in the 2nd or 3rd century A.D. Now think about that for just a moment. When the critics say that Daniel's prophecies had to have been written 300 years after the time of Jesus, that is a tacit admission to their accuracy. Isn't it? Yes or no? I mean, that's the whole point. In other words, you can only come to one of two intellectually honest conclusions. Either the prophecies accurately foretold the future, and the Bible thus is a supernatural book, God's communication to planet Earth, or those prophecies were written at a later date. Now, for example, in the instance of the book of Daniel, there, there is no evidence to speak of that it was written at a later date. You say, well, then why would these scholars say that? Why would some of the higher critics suggest that Daniel was written at a much later date? It's not because of any internal evidence found within the book of Daniel, neither is it from any archaeological evidence that puts the book of Daniel some 300 years after the time of Jesus. The answer is they have a bias against the supernatural. They have a philosophical bias against God's Word. In fact, they don't believe God exists at all. And so the idea that God has a Bible and God has a book and God has foretold the future is by definition not possible. Are we all together, everyone? Yes or no? And so it's not that the evidence points in that direction. The evidence doesn't say, oh, this book was written 300 years after the time of Jesus and some 900 years after the time it was allegedly written. There is no evidence that suggests that. The evidence for it is the fact that the supernatural doesn't exist, miracles do not occur, God is not real. But wait a minute. What if that assumption is wrong? What if the assumption that God isn't real, what if the assumption that the supernatural doesn't exist, what if that is a mistake? You can't say that the prophecies aren't accurate because even the greatest critics say, yes, the prophecies are accurate. And that's why their defense is that they must have been written at a later date, as we've already said, a tacit admission to their accuracy. And so when I was exposed to some of these great prophecies, really it was a, a eureka moment for me. It was one of those pivotal moments in my life where, and you've had them before, where you can either go right or you can go left. You know you're at a watershed experience in your life where you can either go one way or the other. 
And by the grace of God and by His providence and His illimitable mercy, I decided to look into the Bible to see if, in fact, it was what it claimed to be. That was nine years ago, and I can tell you I have absolutely no regrets about accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, the Bible as His Word, and the great prophecies of the Bible as true and accurate. Amen? Amen. So that's really the premise that we're coming from. And, and this is what I began to think about. When, when it came time for me to be exposed to the prophecies of the Bible, I went to a prophecy seminar, okay? I was doing some study on my own, and I was enjoying it, and I had the opportunity to go to a prophecy seminar, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. But there was at least one major problem, and that was this. The prophecy seminar took place over about 27 or 28 nights over the course of about a month and a half. Well, here's the difficulty. If I have to go to that meeting every single night, it's building piece upon piece, but sometimes it built so slow that I began to lose interest. Now, it's not that I was losing interest in the prophecies, but what I have come to think since then is that if someone could have sat me down in four or five or six hours and given me the big picture, just, just very quickly, instead of over a course of a month or several weeks just to sit down and say, this is the big picture of Bible prophecy, I think it literally would have changed my life even before I was 20, almost 24 years old. If someone could have sat me down at 21 and said, here's the big picture, I think it would have been very, very compelling to me. And so when Scotty and I got to discussing this, we said, hey, listen, why don't we do this? Why don't we basically put a, a seminar together in which we present the core of the Bible's meth, uh, pro prophetic message? Why don't we just trim off the fat, so to speak, and, and just give them the core, right to the very heart of what is happening in these last days? And, and that's really what we're going to try and do today, is walk through a series of presentations, six to be exact, and they're going to be somewhat information intensive, but I've decided outright from the very beginning of this that I don't want to go any faster than we're going to assimilate the information, right? If I tell you ten things and you only remember one, that's not nearly as good as if I tell you three and you remember three. Are we all together on that? And so our first presentation is entitled, Urgent, Urgent, Read All About It. Now, prophecy is not just something that is of interest in religious circles. Prophecy is not just something that is of interest in Christian circles. Even the, the major media outlets and Hollywood and even scholars show an interest in the idea of prophecy. Now, I have come to believe that the Bible is, in fact, God's Word. I have come to believe that the Bible can be trusted, that it's accurate, and that it is a genuine reflection of God's will for humanity and for me personally. And so I want to just give you several reasons at the outset here why I believe the Bible is, in fact, God's Word. There are several more that could be cited, but these are basically the core of why I believe the Bible to be the Word of God. In the day and age in which we live, believing that God has spoken through a book is considered to be an antiquated or an outdated idea. It's considered non-sophisticated, non-intellectual, non-intelligent. I have found that belief that God has spoken through a book is actually a very reasonable, very rational, and very defensible conclusion. For example, you can look at the many consistencies of the Bible, and I've given you just a few of them here. We'll run down them quickly. The internal consistency of the Bible, which basically just says that this is a remarkable book, not a single book, but a book that was written over a period of some 1,500 years by nearly 40 authors on three continents. Now, the amazing thing is, is that these authors were writing on what is unquestionably the most difficult and perhaps controversial subject uh, in all of human experience, and that is the existence of God. And yet, from Moses in the book of Genesis to John in the book of Revelation and everything in between, we find that the Bible is internally coherent. That is to say that the Bible internally is consistent, so that Moses agrees with Matthew and Paul agrees with the prophets, etc., etc. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment. If you can take 40 different writers from three different continents over a period of 1,500 years, many of those writers, incidentally, from radically different social and, and vocational backgrounds, writing on the most controversial subject in all of human experience, namely God and His existence, and yet they write with clarity and consistency, that argues strongly for the supernatural origin of the book. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? And so the Bible's internal consistency, another way of saying the Bible's internally consistent is to say that the Bible contains no genuine contradictions. And I stand by that assertion, by the way. The Bible contains no genuine philosophical or theological contradictions. That is to say, the Bible agrees with itself. 
Now the second one there is translational consistency, and I wish I had time to spend more time on that. But basically, the long and the short of it is, since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, you can have total confidence that the Bible that you have before you there on the table, the Bible that you hold in your hands, is in fact the very Bible that the apostles wrote, that the prophets wrote, that have been handed down to us with phenomenal accuracy. I mean, the, the degree of translational accuracy and consistency is extremely remarkable, and then even more so when you consider that this all took place before fax machines, before copy machines, before modern hard drives and all of the technological amenities that we are accustomed to. The Bible has come down to us basically, essentially, exactly as it was written. Now, that argues very strongly for its supernatural preservation and its supernatural origin scientific consistency. We'll probably talk a little bit more about that, but you may have been led to believe or you may have heard that there is some kind of a dichotomy. There's some kind of a tension between science and the Bible. That is to say, if, if you're going to believe in the Bible, then you have to discard all of this modern scientific knowledge, etc., etc. This is a farce and it is absolutely patently untrue. The reality is this, all true science will agree with biblical revelation. You may have heard that, that uh, scientists uh, on the whole are, are unbelievers or agnostics. Actually, the opposite is true. Several surveys have been conducted in the National Academy of the Sciences, and they have discovered that there is no, listen to this, no statistical difference between the number of atheist truck drivers and the number of atheist scientists. No statistical difference between the number of atheist plumbers and the number of atheist scientists. In other words, the, the proportion of scientists, professional scientists who are believers is the very same as the proportion of the population at large that are believers. The proportion of scientists that are agnostics or atheists or unbelievers is the very same proportion in the general population that are atheists or unbelievers, etc., etc. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that science does not predispose someone to unbelief. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? Science does not predispose someone to be a skeptic, not at all. The scientists are not disproportionately unbelievers. In fact, you find just as many believers in the scientific community by percentage as you do in the general population. And so this idea that there is some kind of an antithesis between the Bible and science is absolutely untrue. Now, we can take this a step further. In a remarkable book entitled The Soul of Modern Science, the authors whose names escape me at, ju at just this very moment document something that has been documented before, but they really pull the case together in a nice way. And what they say is this, the only culture, and I hope I don't offend anyone here, but it's, it's documented, the only culture that has given rise to the modern scientific method in the history of all cultures was westernized, Christianized Europe. In other words, scientific, modern scientific inquiry as it exists today was literally birthed out of a biblical paradigm. It was literally birthed out of a biblical modality. If, if you look at the great scientists of old, Johannes Kepler and, and Kelvin and Copernicus and Galilee Galileo, all of these scientists came from a biblical background, from a biblical worldview. And so the idea that the Bible is somehow antithetical to science or against science is patently untrue. You survey the cultures of history and you find the culture where modern scientific inquiry and modern scientific method was birthed and it was basically in westernized, Christianized Europe. Now, I don't want to downplay. There were some uh, important um, advancements in math, at, as, uh, particularly in math and, and a few other disciplines that took place in Arabia, etc. But for the most part, modern scientific method and inquiry came out of a Christian context. And so this idea that science is somehow against the Bible is actually a modern phenomenon and it is patently untrue. Everyone, everyone clear on that? We could talk more about that. Cultural consistency, very powerful. How is it that the Bible can apply so amazingly consistently cross-culturally? How is it possible that, that Ezekiel from Mexico can read the same Bible that I read and, and our cultures are radically different and yet we find the same truth there? How can it be that Vladimir, born and raised in Russia, can come to this book, Vladimir's culture totally different than mine, Vladimir's background totally different than mine, and yet whether you're from Jamaica or from Russia or from Australia or from Mexico, wherever, whether you're black or white or male or female or young or old, the Bible speaks universally transculturally to all of the various different cultures and people groups on the world. Can you say amen? Now, how many other books are there that are like that? 
I mean, there are classics in the French language that probably no one in this room has read, right? Why? Because many times the great classics of a particular language or the great classics of a particular genre rarely get outside of that genre or outside of that people group to whom they minister or to whom they speak, I should say, is a better word. And yet the Bible is universally, transculturally popular. I believe that's inexplicable apart from its supernatural origin. And so we say the Bible is culturally consistent. Archaeological consistency, we can simply say this. There has never been a single archaeological discovery that has controverted even one point of the Bible's history. Now think about that. Uh, archaeologists have been excavating in the near and far east for centuries, and there's not been one single excavation that has controverted a single point of the Bible's history. Now, that argues strongly for the accuracy of the Bible's historical picture. Are, are we all together, everyone? Yes or no? And there are actually instances, by the way, and many of them are well documented, where modern archaeologists who were of the skeptical mindset said the Bible is wrong. Here, for example, when it comes to the existence of a people called the Hittites, the Bible speaks frequently of, of the Hittites, and the Bible would talk about the Hittites in this area and the Hittites in there, and, and yet there were no extra-biblical evidences, that is, evidences outside of the Bible that the Hittites existed, right? And so some skeptics uh, began to say, see, the Bible is washed up, the Hittites aren't a real people, and then archaeological discoveries were made that showed that the Hittite uh, 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 kingdom was actually a very large kingdom, et cetera, et cetera, and that there were many Hittites and great Hittite kings and, and whole cities were discovered and whole histories were discovered, and so basically the Bible was confirmed and not denied. And so it's really amazing when you consider that not a single archaeological discovery has ever been unearthed that has controverted even a single point of the Bible's historical picture. Experiential consistency is my personal favorite, and that is simply this. Every one of us in this room knows in our heart of hearts that God is real and that God exists. That's the point of the video that you just saw. Every person knows that God is real. Now, how do you know that God is real? Because God reveals himself to you in a special, specific way that only you can know. That's the point. When it comes to seeking God, it's not always an, a lack of information. People are like, oh, there's just no evidence out there. Listen, listen, listen. People's unbelief in God is not for lack of evidence. Most of the time, it is for lack of a real desire to know God. Are you with me? That's what the whole video that you just saw is about. And that's what Psalm 14 says that I quote there in the video, that God looked down from heaven upon the children of men, those who say there is no God. He looked down to investigate to see if any of them were really seeking. And, and God says they're not really looking. They're not really seeking. And uh, it's very powerful to consider that God can reveal himself to you in a way that you can know that God is real. I can know that God is real in my innermost soul of souls. Are you with me, yes or no? And every one of us knows that. It is something that we know internally. It's something that we know at the most fundamental level. For example, I know that I exist. It's very difficult for me, by the way, to prove, to demonstrate that I exist. I have much evidence that I exist. I believe internally that I exist. I happen to believe that all of you exist as well. But when you really get to the most fundamental philosophical level, trying to prove one's own existence is not as easy as you might think. This is what led some of the great French philosophers and others who began to question everything. People like René Descartes, who finally reduced life to its most fundamental element and said, I think therefore I am. And actually that's not the best translation. What he really said is, in thinking I exist. In other words, he was trying to figure out how does he know that even he exists? And, and so these reductionistic philosophers went all the way back, all the way back, all the way back. And it, it is somewhat difficult to really explain how we know what we know at the most fundamental level. And yet God has revealed himself to every one of us in a way that we know in our heart of hearts that God is there, that God is real, and that God loves us. In fact, when I opened up the Bible and began to study the Bible, to read the Bible, to pour over the Bible, it became very clear to me that the very Savior, the very God, the very Creator that my heart was crying for was the very one revealed in the Holy Scriptures. And you say amen? And it was just like a hand in glove fit. The very thing that I needed, the very God that I wanted to be there and that I longed for to be there was the very one that in fact 
was there in the pages of the Holy Bible. And that's why we say the Bible is experientially consistent. And so you look over these various consistencies, and, and I like to challenge my skeptical friends who sometimes come off as quasi-intellectual. You know, they, they tend to think that all Christians are washed up and that all Christians are uh, uh, anti-intellectual, all Christians are naive and, and even perhaps stupid. I used to believe that. I, I used to be one of those people that believed that. But the reality is when you look at the great consistencies of the Bible, the internal consistency, the translational consistency, scientific consistency, cultural consistency, archaeological consistency, historical consistency, and experiential consistency, it becomes very difficult to, to refute the case that the Bible is in fact a supernatural book. And then the final one there, bold for the purposes of our seminar today. We could give a seminar, by the way, on any one of them. We could easily give a six-hour seminar on the Bible's translational consistency, the Bible's scientific consistency. In fact, when I was just in California, I had the privilege of spending a significant amount of time with one of my dear friends, Dr. Sean Pittman, who is one of the most brilliant scientific minds that I personally know of. In fact, in the next uh, um, prophecy seminar that I do, I'm going to fly him in to give a whole day lecture on the Bible and science. The guy is absolutely, totally brilliant. He could come here today and present a 10-hour, Lord have mercy, he could present a 100-hour seminar on the Bible's consistency with science. And so we could do all of these. We could bring in an archaeologist to talk about that. We could talk about the historicity of the Bible, whatever. But today we're going to spend some time looking at the prophecies. The what, everyone? Prophecies. The prophecies of the Bible. And the Bible is prophetically consistent. Now, in beginning, we're going to ask two fundamental questions. And these are the same two fundamental questions we asked when we did our seminar um, two months ago, Discover Prophecy, and that is this. First of all, we have to define our terms. What is prophecy? And then we're going to ask the question, where can I find true and reliable prophecy? Uh, whenever we're going to begin anything of this nature, we have to adequately and sufficiently define our terms. And so we begin by answering the question, what is prophecy? And it's actually very, very simple. Prophecy is simply a foretelling of events or a prediction. It's a foretelling of events, or a what, everyone? Or a prediction. And we ask the second question, where can I find true and reliable prophecy? And the thesis of our presentation this afternoon and this morning is that you can find true and reliable foretellings and predictions of events right here in this book called the Bible. For example, God puts himself on trial in the pages of the Scripture in a very risky way. Incidentally, one of the great... Uh, determiners of whether or not a, a, a theory is genuinely scientific is, is that theory able to make risky predictions, okay? Uh, this is why uh, Sigmund Freud and, and, and some of the others, they, they made predictions that were not risky, and, and people, after F uh, F Freud passed off the scene and his psychoanalysis and all that, uh, began to be not so popular, people began to look at, at Freud's uh, so, so-called scientific hypothesis, and they said, you know what? It's not really very scientific because it makes no risky predictions. If, if, if uh, a Freudian uh, uh, psychologist or, or a Freudian, uh, uh, somebody from the Freudian school examined a person and uh, say their mother was abusive and their father was disinterested and then that person exhibited certain behaviors, Freud would say, aha, that's exactly what we expected to find. And then they could examine somebody who had a, a, a disinterested father and an, or a disinterested mother and an abusive father, and they would, uh, whatever the behaviors that were exhibited in the child, they'd say, aha, that's exactly what we expected to find. They never found any cases that refuted their basic premise. Well, think about that for just a moment. If you never find anything that begins to refute your basic premise, that means that everything confirms your thesis. But if everything confirms your thesis, then this is what's called non-falsifiable. It means that your theory is always true under all circumstances. It makes no risky predictions. And people began to say, hmm, maybe we've been duped by this whole idea of Freudian psychology. Now, contrast that with Albert Einstein. When Albert Einstein began to introduce his theories of relativity, talking about the space-time continuum, now, he made many of his predictions, incidentally, before we had the many of the modern scientific amenities that we have today, and he made some extremely risky predictions about the nature of the universe, and sure enough, his predictions were all confirmed. Not all of them, but the primary predictions that he made about the nature of the theory of relativity and space-time continuum, they were confirmed. And so what happens is, when a scientific theory, are you with me, everyone? When a scientific theory is confirmed, it gains predictive scope. That is to say, it, it, it appears to be more and more and more credible. Okay? If, if you predict uh, something that's not extraordinary, who cares? Now, the Bible is very scientific in this regard. 
the Bible makes some extremely risky predictions. In fact, you find one of them here in Isaiah chapter 46, okay? Isaiah chapter 46, God says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. Now that is an extremely risky prediction. It's really an extremely risky position. God says, I'm God, no one else is God, and I will demonstrate the fact that I'm God because I can tell the future and nobody else can tell the future. Are you with me, everyone? Yes or no? Now, if that's true, if somebody could consistently and accurately foretell the future, then by definition, we would call that being God. Are we all together, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, now, just like a scientific theory... The, the more that that theory tells us and the riskier its predictions and the more often it's confirmed, we then gain confidence in that scientific theory and it eventually becomes scientific fact. For example, even the law of gravity. The law of gravity, we call it a law, but in the strict scientific sense, it's still really the theory of gravity. In other words, we, it, it always seems to work, it always appears to work, and in common nomenclature, we refer to it as the, the law of gravity, but a, a, a scientist would tell you there are no set laws, right? There, there are just predictions that are then confirmed. There are predictions that are consistently confirmed, and the more consistently those predictions are confirmed, the more confidence we have in those various predictions, so much so that they begin to exhibit a law-like nature. For example, the law of gravity. Are we all together, everyone? Yes or no? And, and so this idea, as the Bible makes a prediction, we say, hmm, that's interesting. But then it makes another prediction, and that comes true. We say, hmm, that's even more interesting. And then the Bible makes yet another risky prediction, and that is true. And as the Bible continues to make these amazing predictions, and we look back over the way that it has come to pass, just as God has said, this gives us confidence that it will continue to be accurate in the future. Are you with me, everyone? Yes or no? And so in this sense, the Bible is actually exceedingly scientific. And this is why we say, incidentally, what we just said a moment ago, that, that the idea that, that true scientific inquiry came out of a Christian context, came out of a biblical context, because, frankly, Christian people had the expectation that the universe would be ordered, that the universe would make sense, that the universe would be understandable. Are you with me, everyone? Yes or no? In fact, when Galileo and Copernicus and others, when they began to make inquiry about the world around them, they had the expectation that God had made the universe and they were simply finding out how God did it. They had the expectation that the universe would be uniform, that the universe would be orderly, that the universe would be commonsensical. But really, think about it. If God doesn't exist, and the whole universe is really just pieces of matter just spitting all around, and basically all you have is matter and energy, why would you have the expectation that there would be orderly, uniform laws that govern the nature of matter? You would expect the exact opposite. You would expect chaos. You wouldn't look for consistency in your scientific experiments. You wouldn't look for consistency as Galileo did in the great circuits of the planets and the stars, etc. The reason that the, many of these great initial scientists began to make the inquiries that they did is they believed that God had created the world. They believed that God had revealed himself in the Bible. And they wanted to discover how God did what he did. Are you with me, everyone? Yes or no? And so we need to disabuse our minds of this ridiculous idea that the Bible is somehow naive, unintellectual, unsophisticated, and not scientific. In fact, at its most rudimental, rudimentary core, the Bible expects us to be scientific in our evaluation. God says, listen, I'm God, no one else is God, and I'll prove it by consistently, accurately foretelling the future. And that's what a prophecy is. It's a foretelling of events. Jesus said it in just the simplest language in John chapter 14, verse 29. Jesus said, and now I have told you before it takes place. Now I have told you what, everyone? Before. See that? Before it takes place. Okay? I'm going to tell you something in advance so that when it does take place, you may what? Believe. That, that is more or less what Albert Einstein did when he made his various predictions. Of course, we're not comparing Albert Einstein to Jesus, but only in this sense. He made various predictions about the nature of reality, the nature of the universe, and when those predictions came to be true, we could have confidence in other things he said. Jesus says here, it's very simple. I'll tell you what's going to happen. I'll tell you what's going to happen in the future. And when it happens, just as I've said, you can have confidence that everything else I've said is true as well. You with me? Yes or no? 
And so the Bible here, this is one of the things that spoke to me there. I was 23 years old, as I've already said, studying pre-medicine at the University of Wyoming, being trained in a scientific context, being trained in a scientific inquiry methodology. One of the things that appealed to me about the Bible was that it didn't want me to bypass my intellectual uh, thinking. It didn't want me to bypass my mind. It, it actually engaged my mind. It said, hey, listen, in, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, God says, hey, come now, let us reason together. It, it, God is basically saying, hey, pull up a chair, sit down at the table, let's talk this out. The God presented in the Bible is a rational God, a reasonable God, a God who, who actually made our mind in the image of the, His d uh, divine mind, and that is a rational mind, a logical mind, and He invites inquiry. Can you say amen? And God does not do not... If you learn anything today, and hopefully you'll learn many, many things, but if you learn anything in this first session, learn this. God does not have the unrealistic expectation of you that you will believe without evidence. Are you with me? You, know, you did not have to check your brain at the door. You checked your coat at the door, but not your brain at the door. The God of the Bible invites us to look in an intellectually consistent, intelligent credible, rational way at his claims and then determine whether or not those claims are true. Now, I'm going to maintain today that God's claims are, in fact, true and credible and accurate. Are you with me? So, that's prophecy, basically. In a nutshell, that is prophecy. Now, other religious books, incidentally, do not contain a great deal of prophecy. And I think this is telling, by the way. You can look at the writings of Confucius, contained really no prophecy. There is uh, the so-called wisdom of the East, but no predicting of future events. So too with the writings of Buddha and uh, with even the, the, the Quran. No prophecies as such. Now, when you look at the Bible, a full 30% of the Bible is prophecy or a foretelling of events or a, a prediction of events. Now, this, this is something that's absolutely so simple that it almost goes without saying. In order for God to declare the future, he would have to, by definition, first know the future. Doesn't that make sense, everyone? In order for God to declare the future, he would have to first know the future, okay? So the question that comes up in my mind, and, and you know, you could read the wisdom of Confucius, you could read the writings of Buddha, you can even read parts of the Quran. And I'm not going to say today that there are not valuable things in those books. In fact, I would maintain there are many valuable things in those books, okay? No one's disputing the fact that those books contain valuable bits of information. Now, whether or not they are the revealed will of God is a different question altogether. The point is this. If those books are not making risky predictions about the future and then expecting fulfillments of those risky predictions to increase the credibility of that book, to me, that does not hold near as much interest as a book that claims to be supernatural, makes risky predictions about the future, and then those risky predictions come to pass. Are you with me, yes or no? Listen, there are lots of wise people in the world. There's lots of intelligent people in the world, people much more intelligent than David Ashrick that could stand up here and say, when a tree falls in the woods and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? And we all say, ooh, oh. He said, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And we could all just, wow. There are people that could come and say very wise things. And listen, we could be in awe of these extremely wise people, but, but I want something more than just to be in awe of somebody who's smarter than me. Are you with me? I want to know if God is real. I want to know if the Bible can be trusted. And so you just line the Bible up against all these other religious books, and it's not even a matter of better. It's a matter of different. If I have a hundred books over here that are all supernatural, or not supernatural, that are all, you know, wonderful wisdom books and contain lots of information, hey, listen, that's good. No problem. Before I became a Christian, I read some of the Hindu writings. I read the Bhagavad Gita as it is. I read some of the Buddhist writings, and I read some of the uh, books like the Celestine Prophecy. And Oh, these are all very interesting and contained little anecdotes that I could apply to my life. But then the Bible was unique. The Bible was like, hey, I'm God, nobody else is God, and I'll prove it. I'll predict the future. Well, if God predicted the future and He said, X is going to happen and then X didn't happen, it would lose predictive credibility. And the Bible says, God says, Y is going to happen, and then Y doesn't happen, the Bible begins to lose predictive credibility. Are we all together, everyone, yes or no? But if the Bible says A is going to happen, and then A comes to happen, just as God said, it gains predictive credibility. And then God says B is going to happen. So, oh, and then B comes to happen just as God suggested, God said, then it gains more predictive credibility. And then when the critics of the Bible come along and say, well, these prophecies aren't really prophecies because they were written later. 
You know what that tells me? It tells me the prophecies are accurate. That is a tacit admission. In other words, if I make, if I make a prediction about who's going to win the Super Bowl, what the score is going to be, who's going to score the touchdown, and I made some even risky predictions. I don't know if any of you saw the Super Bowl or not. I actually saw the Super Bowl. I hadn't seen it in one in years. I actually watched it with my brother-in-law. And the first kickoff, I don't know the name of the guy, but a, a Chicago Bear uh, caught the ball and ran it all the way down, like 97 yards for a touchdown. It was the first time it had ever happened in Super Bowl history. How many of you saw that? The first time, and when I saw that, I thought, this game is over, man. This game is over. The Chicago Bears are on fire. Now, what if I had predicted that? Would that have been a risky prediction, yes or no? If I would have said, let me tell you what's going to happen on the opening play. And uh, I predicted it, and would you think that what I said about the rest of the game would, would, might be true, yes or no? Sure. I mean, maybe not, but at least I've gained predictive credibility. We all on the same page, everyone, yes or no? That's the way the Bible is. Right? If, now, now, let's talk about a non-risky prediction. I predict that someone will win the Super Bowl. Right? D does my prediction, d does, d do I gain any predictive credibility at the end of the day when the Colts win? No, not at all. But if I make specific predictions, now, what if I had predicted all of these details about the Super Bowl? Right? You could only come to one of two conclusions. Well, you could maybe come to a third, but that would be unreasonable. You could come to the conclusion that David is a prophet and he knows the future. That would be one prediction you could come to. You could come to the, or that would be one conclusion. Another conclusion you could come to would be that David actually made all this up afterward and he made it look like he had done it before. Are you with me? Yes or no? So I watched the whole thing, and then I went and I typed an email or a letter out what was going to happen, and then I predated it before the Super Bowl. You with me? Or you could say he got lucky. Right? But we'll say that my predictions were so risky and so amazing that, that circ uh, you know, circumstantial happening, happenstance, is not, that's not accurate. You've only got two conclusions, beloved. Either I knew it or I made it up. And the accuracy of my predictions rules out any other option. You can't say circumstantial. Well, it just, no, 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 no. And so when the critics come to the Bible and say, well, those prophecies were written after the fact... That ought to tell you something. Hey, maybe they're right. But if they're not right, they have just demonstrated that the prophecies are accurate enough to require another explanation. Are we all on the same page, yes or no? Let me give you a good illustration. When the body of Jesus turned up missing, right? Jesus has been put in the tomb, and uh, sure enough, Sunday morning, whoo, the body is missing. Right? And the disciples are going to the streets of Jerusalem and say, Jesus is risen from the dead, he's risen. And, and all of a sudden this preaching about Jesus as the Messiah uh, being risen from the dead, that begins to permeate Jerusalem. What happened is the religious leaders, do you think they went to the tomb to check it out? Sure they did. They wanted to see if that was true. And so they come to the tomb and they say, whoa, this is the very same tomb we put all the guards at. And they check the other tombs to be sure they didn't have And they're, all the tombs are empty. Jesus' tomb is empty. The guards are saying, yeah, this is where it was. Guess what? They have to explain it, right? There's a fact, and they've got to explain it. And so they put, put their heads together and say, oh, we've got a good idea. The disciples came and stole it. Are you with me, everyone? Yes or no? But here's the point. Even in their explanation is a tacit admission the body is gone. Are you with me? Yes or no? I mean, if they would have exhumed the body of Jesus and paraded it through the streets of Jerusalem, you and I would not be sitting in this room today. There would be no Christianity. Are you with me? So, so just think about that. In their explanation, they are actually assuming a major point that the disciples are making, and that is the tomb is empty. But we have another explanation. Now the question then becomes, whose explanation is more credible? Are you with me? We'll actually maybe talk a little bit about that later. So when you look at the accuracy of the prophecies, you've only got two options, right? You've only got two options. Either they were written after the fact, right, and somebody's playing a big trick, or they were written before the fact and the Bible is true. So far, so good? Is that rational? Is that reasonable? Okay, so this is what I was confronted with, you know, some nine years ago when a metallurgical engineer, or I guess he was an electrical engineer, sat down with me by the name of Joshua Marco and said, you know, let me show you something you might find interesting. And he started showing me some of the prophecies of the Bible. I could only come to two conclusions. There are only two possible intellectually honest conclusions. Either the Bible is accurately foretelling the future, and thus, the Bible is supernatural, and God is real, and God wants to be my friend and Savior and Redeemer and Lord, or someone's playing a big trick. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. Well, then we're, we're actually making some very good headway here. 
There are four essential survival prophecy. There are four reasons why God gives prophecy. Okay? Very powerful, very simple. And I'll just run over them. Number one, to set the God of the Bible apart from other gods as the true God. Okay? You actually find this in the book of Daniel. You find it in many places where Daniel comes in there before King Nebuchadnezzar. We'll talk about this in just a moment. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar says, can you show me the dream? Some of you might know that dream. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and, and, uh, and, and he knew that it was important. And so Daniel comes in before the king and the king says, can you show me the dream? And Daniel says, yes. But guess what? The astrologers, the wise men, and all of these pagans that you have on the divine payroll, they cannot show you the dream. But there's a God in heaven that can show you the dream. What is Daniel doing? He's setting the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, apart from all the other so-called gods. Are you with me, yes or no? So one of the reasons that God gives us Bible prophecy is so that we can make a clear demarcation in our minds between the God of the Bible and other so-called gods. So far, so good? Yes or no? Okay, number two. To accurately reveal the future and thus create faith in the heart of the hearer. That's what we've been talking about. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, says Romans 10, 17. Listen, by the end of this seminar, you will be able, in my humble opinion, you would only be able to come to one of two conclusions. Either the Bible is accurate or it must have been written at a much later date. Because by the end of this seminar, I will show you, in fact, I have books in my bag just back there, some cutting-edge information as to how Bible prophecy is being fulfilled literally right today before our very eyes. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Number three, third essential of Bible prophecy is to reveal to the hearer the thoughts and priorities of his heart. One of the things that Bible prophecy did for me when I was studying there at the University of Wyoming, and I remember sitting in a particular coffee shop, and I, I came across a certain prophecy, and I remember I had the moment of clarity, the moment of understanding in that coffee shop, and I had this thought, and the thought went something like this. If God is real, right? The prophecy was pretty accurate, and I was like, whoa, and I had this eureka moment sitting there sipping my cappuccino. I had this eureka moment. And the, the, the thought went something like this. If God is real, then he made me. If he made me, he has a legitimate call and expectation on my life. I am accountable to God. You know, that, 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 that uh, line of reasoning happens very quick in the mind. <laughs> you know, it just, you know, you, the person's on the airplane and, you know, whew, everything's just fine and you're sitting back watching the movie, putting in the music, checking on your computer, listening to the iPod and everything's fine. All of a sudden, <laughs> and, you know, mild turbulence, right? And, and everybody is able to have the realization about death very quickly. It doesn't take, a, you know, a PhD in, in philosophy to figure it out. If I die here and there's a God, I'm going to meet him, so I'm going to hedge my bets and make things right with him now. God, I'm so sorry. I wish I hadn't done this and this and this and this and this, and please, if you get me off this airplane, I'll live for you. Are you with me? I had that same kind of a moment in the coffee shop. I mean, it was so amazing. As I was reading over the prophecies, I remember looking around. Everybody else was just sipping their coffee, coffee studying their sociology, political science, and history, and I'm just, and I'm thinking to myself, I think I just figured out that God is real. Wait a minute, if God is real, that means he's in this coffee shop. <laughs> and he knows what I'm doing. And, and, and just, I mean, it's just amazing. You can go from unbeliever to believer and repentant sinner in about 20 seconds. I mean, it just happens instantaneously. And, and beloved, that's one of the reasons that God gives us prophecy. So he can say, wake up. I'm real. I'm here. I, I know the future. And we can say, ah. Uh, better rearrange my priorities, better start restructuring my life so it reflects the plan that God has for me, not because I'm afraid of him, but because he has done so much good for me. Mm. And number four, to introduce the hearer to Jesus Christ and his heart's need of him, and that's really an extension of number three. So as we begin our prophecy seminar, let's be crystal clear on what we're here to figure out. What we're here to figure out is actually very, very simple. And I'm not, listen, I'm being perfectly transparent with you, Gene, right here at the outset. I'm, I'm letting you know, I believe the Bible is God's word. I believe that the Bible has accurately foretold the future. And I believe that those prophecies are coming to pass right before our very eyes. And I believe Jesus, Jesus Christ, God's son, is coming soon in the clouds of glory. I believe that. I believe everything I just said to you with all my heart. And, and here's the point of our first session. That is not wild-eyed, irrational, non-scientific Christian hyperbole. I believe it's true, 
and it's rational and it's credible and it's reasonable and it's the kind of thing we can just come to that we can investigate that we can use the powers of our mind instead of leaving them at the door and we can look and say hmm yeah 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 I guess that's right are you with me I've presented enough of these Bible prophecy seminars all over the world to see the light come on I've seen the light come on in the mind of Jamaicans I've seen the light come on in the mind of people from Honduras. I've seen the light come on in the minds of Australians. I've seen the light come on all over the world. I've seen ding, 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 ding. Because people, even in radically different cultures, all tend to think basically the same about what's true and what's false and how do I know what's true and how do I know what's false and how do I make basic, reasonable deductions about reality. Are you with me? And, and our premise today is going to be that there are, in fact, answers in Bible prophecy. Good answers, powerful answers, compelling answers. And we're going to see that some of these things are happening literally right before our very eyes. Okay? So that's, that's the direction that we're headed today. Is that what you signed up for? Yeah? Can you, can you handle it? Okay, great. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness, mercy, and kindness. We thank you that you say to us in Isaiah 1, 18, Come now. Let us reason together. Father, you don't ask us to put our minds on the shelves. You ask us to employ our minds. After all, we are made in your image. You are the supremely rational being. You have revealed yourself to us as a rational God, a rational God who does not have the unrealistic expectation that we would believe without evidence. In fact, right there in the classic formulation of faith, Father, you say that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things that we can't see. And so you give us evidence so that we can believe more and then more and then more. And Father, as we consider the prophecies of the Bible, we want to understand in a powerful, compelling, and life-changing way not just what your plan is for the world in general, but Father, what is your plan for me? This is our heart's prayer as we commence with our Answers and Prophecy Seminar. In Jesus Christ's name, we boldly pray. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen.